this other one. Weighted average cost of capital. And weighted average cost of capital is simply a modestly complex formula that gives us a discount rate from the standpoint of the firm. Because it's the capital in the firm's possession that we are putting a weighted average cost on. And we want to make this wholly a opportunity cost, which means it must be market oriented. And so we're about to differ from almost every finance textbook that you'll see in this country as we talk about WAC tonight. Because we're going to talk about a completely market oriented version of weighted average cost of capital. We're not going to talk about a book one. So let's start with book though so you can understand the construction. Okay? I'm going to differentiate book and market with uh, red for market, <coughs> blue for book. Okay? So we've got this equation. As E divided by V, and I think we, we went over a little bit of that last week, did we not? It's the first one. Yeah. 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 E divided by V times RE plus P divided by V times RP plus D divided by V times RD times 1 minus tax rate on taxable income. In an environment in which E plus P plus D is equal to V. Ugh. Shake your head for me. Okay. Well, E is the value of the common stock. And I said value, I didn't say market or book because I'm talking about book at the moment, right? I'm looking at a non-market construction of WAC. But it is what most textbooks will give you. The, the amount of common stock on the balance sheet, so the amount of money that the company received for the common stock when the company sold the common stock, which may have been yesterday, so it may be relatively accurate in terms of market value, or it may have been 50 years ago, and it was issued at a dollar per share, and now it would have a theoretical market value of $1,000 a share. So those numbers may have no bearing on each other. P is the book value, in this case, of the preferred stock. D is the book value of the company's long-term capital debt, not current <coughs> liabilities, because they're not capital debt. And this T, is the tax rate on taxable income. Okay? Well, we have ways of thinking about RD, RP, and RE. And at least RE, by necessity, is an opportunity cost and a market construction. So the reason that I reject most textbook versions of uh, WAC is because we're interacting a value that must be a market construction with a value that is not a market construction. We are putting oil and water together and expecting it to come out one or the other, not one and the other. And that's just silly. Okay? But there's a reason why most finance textbooks do that. Because to do the alternative requires more work and we can't always assure that we get the right number. So let's look at what some of those might be. First of all, when I say E plus P plus D equals V, that then tells me that each one of these fractions is the percentage of the company's capital structure represented by common, preferred, and debt combined. Because that is, those are the capital elements for the company. And sometimes we won't have preferred. So if, if we are doing a WAC equation, book or market, and the company has no preferred, well, zero divided by V times something is just zero, it goes away. You don't even have to represent it. But if there's preferred, you've got to represent it. Okay? I'm sorry. Yeah, Can please. Tell me what V is. V is simply the total of these three. So it means that it's the, that is the market, or it's the value, book or market, however we're looking at it, Walter, of the company's capital structure. But it's simply for this purpose, it's just the total of the three such that we then create a number that tells us what percentage of the company's capital structure is equity, what percentage is preferred stock, what percentage is debt. That's all it is. So you're, you add up all the, all the common, all the preferred, all the debt equals V, and then kind of retroactively go back and plug in V? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a little bit of reverse thinking there, right? Okay. Well, if we were thinking of this in a market construction, well, first, some textbooks go far enough to get a little bit more creative, and they'll say the market cap of the preferred or the common and the market cap of the preferred. But the book value of the debt. Oil and water, and we're going to expect it to become one or the other instead of realizing it's going to be one and the other. Okay? Whenever you're combining the inputs, you don't end up with a pure number. Well, again, it's because it's hard to come across some of these values. If we have a publicly traded firm, coming up with the value of the common stock is easy. The number of shares outstanding of common stock times the price per share in the last transaction, right? Preferred, number of shares of preferred stock times the price per share in the last transaction that took place. That, those are the market values of the common and preferred, period. How do you find the market value of a firm's debt? Think about this. Maybe the firm has on its balance sheet some bonds, which most publicly traded firms have, some bank loans, maybe a credit line, and maybe some uh, mortgages. I think those are all relatively common debt uh, instruments that might show up on a corporation's balance sheet. Okay. Well, do you remember from a prior course an equation that will let you find the market value of a bond? Let me see if you do. Call an ambulance. Have a heart Okay, well, we're, we're good. we'll spend some time with that equation. It will become your new best friend before we're done. Start it tonight. Okay? It's the bond value equation. My guess is you'll recognize it when you see it. You just don't remember it immediately. I know a few of you because I think I taught it to you. You're about, you're about to embarrass me here. I'm not doing that. Um, so we know we have an equation that we'll review that we can pretty readily, if we have the right information, which is pretty easy to get, we can know what the market value of the bonds are. Bank loans. How do I know the market value of a bank? So, Josue, um, I, I'm, I have a bank. I'm the manager of the bank. Uh, you have a $10 million loan with my bank. Um, happy to get your interest payments each uh, each month, quarter, whatever they happen to be. Uh, you, uh, and it's just interest only. Because by the way, most corporate debt is not amortized. Most corporate debt with large corporations is interest only, and they're balloons. Not all, but most. They kind of mimic bonds. Bonds are interest only, right, until the end of the time period. So most most bank loans for corporations the same way. Uh, if if it was five million dollars and you had $5 million outstanding on this loan, and you walked in today with a check for $4 million, would I say that the loan's been paid in full? No. I agree with you. Even if you argued that, well, interest rates have gone up since the loan was issued, its market value has gone down because of that, we'll use the bond value equation to evidence that in a few minutes, I would still say, hey, that's neat. You remember the contract you signed that said $5 million? It didn't say maybe $5 million, okay? Similarly, if you walked in to pay it off and, mark, and interest rates had gone down, I wouldn't say, hey, that is so cool, $6 million. If you got your check for five, you see, you're out of your mind. I got a contract that says $5 million. You're not going to be able to hold me hostage for six, right? So a bank loan probably, probably governed <coughs> by the contract is not going to recognize a market value. It's going to be the contract. Now, some bankers are prescient enough to recognize the market value, especially if it's big, right? What about a credit line? How much do you guys know about credit lines? Can anyone describe a credit line for a corporation for me? So, um, it's a thing, right? right? No, I'm doing it wrong. Hmm? Kuhn? Yeah. Sorry. Is your last name thing? Yeah. So there's no fang at all. You don't even have fang. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. I apologize. I, 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 we're, going, we're going to Italy together in a few weeks, and he's in another class, and I don't remember his name. And now I'm embarrassed. Is fang your last name? Yeah. Okay, it's your fault. Okay, I like that. 
It's not. It's my own problem. I apologize. For I should know this. Um, so you have a corporation, and you don't necessarily need to borrow money today, and so it's probably the best time for you to try, right? Because when you need to borrow money, is it easier or harder to get? When you need it? Harder. Harder. Come on, let's get rid of it. So you don't need to borrow money today, so you want to go ahead and line up the opportunity to borrow money without having to come back and ask permission in the future. That's called a credit line. <coughs> and you might come to my bank and you might negotiate a $1 million credit line with my bank. That means that at any point in time during the length of the contract that we've agreed upon, you can come in and you can get at least a million dollars of credit from the bank. And you can take it out, pay it off. Maybe you only take out $100,000 of it, pay some of it off, take out another $100,000. It's very flexible, very variable. Okay? And because of that variability, I know that I don't know when you're going to borrow it, do I? I know when you wrote, signed the contract, but I don't know when you're going to come. And be, because of that, the interest rate that we've agreed upon is the interest rate that's present at the time of borrowing, or it adjusts daily. Okay? So almost all credit lines are adjustable rate loans. I've not seen a large bank credit line that is not ever. <coughs> Because okay. your bank never knows how much you're going to have out on any given day. Well, given that the, the interest rate adjusts up and down with the market, <coughs> you're going to see that whether you put a market value on it by using the bond value calculation or you use its book value for its market value, it's the same number. Because what causes the bond value calculation to give you a different number than the bond was issued at, is its value, is the friction between changing interest rates. Interest rates go up, the bond value goes down. Interest rates go down, the bond value goes up. Interest rates remain constant, the bond's value remains constant. And in this case, the interest rate on a credit line is probably equal to that day's current yield in the market. It never changes from that benchmark. The benchmark itself moves, but it's moving up and down with the benchmark. It's never, it's never friction. So we're going to take that at book value. We're going to take many bank loans at, mar at book value unless we have a reason to think we can apply a market value formula to it. So market for bonds probably book for bank loans. Sometimes market depends on how they're constructed, what information we have. Book value for credit lines. What about a mortgage? Mark, Please. I got a quick question. So, yeah. uh, do you mean usually the, the interest rate of credit lines will be higher than the bank loan? Yeah, almost certainly. Why? Because you, as a bank, you have to prepare those money right there. Otherwise, you, the opportunity cost, the opportunity. Yeah, there, there's, there's some unknown with credit lines. I don't know when you're going to need the money. I don't know how long you're going to have it. So, so that variability usually changes the number. Okay? Yeah. Good point. Good point. So let's think about a mortgage for a minute. So I have a $300,000 mortgage against my $500,000 house. Okay? And uh, my $300,000 mortgage is at a set interest rate. Uh, let's say it's 3.5%. Yeah, that's probably not an uncommon story in this valley, <laughs> in this neighborhood, for that matter, right? Um, interest rates change, and I want to pay off my mortgage. If they went up, is the bank going to accept a different dollar value than I have outstanding in the balance? No, it's a contract, right? <clears throat> if they went down, I can't expect the bank is going to give me anything different either, right? It's a contract. So we have that problem. We have this contract, kind of like the bank loan, and we got another problem. What is it? What stands behind a mortgage? The value of the real estate, which always goes up in value, right? Always and forever? No. Well, that's what, my, that's what the mortgage and real estate guy told me in 2006. And then I couldn't find him in 2007, right? <coughs> As it turns out, he was incarcerated, and I, he appeared on a paper in 2008. So 
we got to think about mortgages as book value because the reality is the complexity of really valuing them is beyond our capability. We proved that to ourselves not long ago. Now, if we were looking at this very intensively at a bunch of attorneys, a bunch of accounts, a bunch of economists, we might be able to disaggregate the mortgage pool, all this kind of stuff. We might be able to figure it all out, but we're not going to do that. We're going to take it a book value. So, D, sometimes, if it's all bonds, can be given purely a market value. Or maybe if there's some bank loans, it could even be given a market value. If it's got some other interest or items in it, it might have to be given a book value, but it's going to be as close to the market value as we can get it. So, we're going to think that it's a market value because the market value and those book values are the same number as far as we're concerned. In which case, we now have a market V. We always want a market WAC because you'll find that WAC is the mother of all opportunity costs. It is the most finely calculated of the opportunity costs we can think about. Okay? from the standpoint of the firm, which means we probably need to talk about our E, our P, and our D to get there. All right? So. Our D. Our D is the opportunity cost of debt. Debt capital. So, um, Kuhn, you took out a loan for $100,000 four years ago. Interest rates were at 7% when you took the loan out, okay? Um, today, interest rates on that same kind of loan, with your kind of credit, everything else the same as we expected it to be, today those interest rates are 6%. What is your opportunity cost of that capital? Is it 7% or 6%? Remember what I said, we could think of as our opportunity cost. It said it's that 1% spread. Well, the, that's not the, the cost isn't the spread. The cost is one of the two numbers. Six. Because if I, had, if I went out to the market today, it would cost me six today. Forget that it costs you seven. You might say, wait a minute, I write a check for interest every month for 7%. How is it not 7%? My response is, bummer for you. You ought to renegotiate the debt. The opportunity cost, okay? If we're using a market construction of D from the E, P, and D, we've got to use a market-based opportunity cost. So the very best opportunity cost of debt for our D is the current yield in the market today for that type of debt. We know that interest rates change. We know that sometimes companies' credit <coughs> ratings change, right? Just like consumers' credit ratings change. So this RD might change. What if we don't know the company's credit rating? We don't know the market <coughs> debt pressure. Is there any other way, perhaps inferior, but acceptable way to find it? Well, there is. We can take the interest paid in time one divided by the value of the debt in time zero. So let's think about why we're differentiating time one and time zero. Time one is the most recent, zero is the one that came before it, right? So we just have a one period lag. When you have debt and you make your interest payment, do you pay it on the amount of the debt that that instant in time or do you pay it on the balance of the debt over the period of time represented by the interest payment you're about to make? It's historic, isn't it? We go back in time. We go back in time. Okay? Well, sometimes we don't have all of these either. So maybe we have to then take interest rate simply divided by the debt for any period. So we have best Okay, and it'll do. <laughs> Only in a pinch. Okay? Because 
we're always working off of the best information we have. And if we don't have some of these better forms, then we're going to be satisfied with the best that we have, right? And if we don't have any of these, we'll just guess because your number is just going to be a guess anyway, right? Okay. So what you're seeing is there may be a hierarchy on what's acceptable for each of these three variables, RE, RP, and RD. And in RD, if you know what the current yield is in a similar debt in the market today, that's the number to use. It's going to be the most accurate value. If you don't know it, you might default to the next. If you don't know it, you might default to the next. Okay? Does that make sense? So if I told you that a debt, um, uh, that, that a managed corporation borrowed money at 7% nine years ago, and today because of the success of the Alobos Corp, it could borrow at 4%, what would be our D for Manny's company? 7% nine years ago, today 4%, what would be the R D for Manny's company? 4%. 4%. Yeah. Yeah, I know you didn't want to say it because it sounded too simple. It is, <laughs> but I want you to get used to it being simple. Because little else is going to be, right? Okay. RP. Uh, the opportunity cost of preferred capital. By the way, you'll hear me use rate of return, return on, cost of, opportunity cost, interchangeable. How is it that I can say the return on or the rate of return on or the cost of are the same number? Chris, you're going to loan me $1,000. What are you going to charge me interest rate? Be realistic. Two percent. Wow, I didn't say phenomenal, generous. <laughs> but thank you very much, by the way. He doesn't know me well enough. It should have been twenty-seven percent. I'm like, okay. okay. So two uh, percent. So you're going to get two percent, right? That's going to be your return on that thousand. Yep. What's going to be my cost? Hold on. Oh no. It's what you're charging me. It's the same number. We're just looking at it from two different perspectives. The rate of return and the cost are the same number depending upon the perspective you're looking at it from. Okay? Same thing. That's why I'll use the interchange. All right. So the rate of return, the opportunity cost of uh, preferred capital. And I know that it's in an obscure world where that actually looked like an R. That's a little bit better. Um, do I have a good ability to just know what a current yield is for preferred capital? Is one preferred stock issue like another preferred stock issue like another, like another, like another? Voting rights, conversion privileges, when it's going to be called, what it can convert to, um, all these things change, not to mention the changing nature of the company that was issued. There is no such thing. Robert and I say, well, uh, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric preferred Series A has a uh, has a uh, return in uh, current yield of seven percent. So that should be what the number is for Series B, C, D, and E. And I say, yeah, we're not for the fact that the conversion rights were different on each one, and all of a sudden we're off to the races. So we don't have a current yield. In fact, the dividends paid at time one <coughs> divided by the value of the preferred stock, and I just realized I'm writing this in the wrong color. Dividends paid time one divided by the preferred value at time one. And since it's red, it's market value. And the amount that gets paid is always market value, right? You give me a dollar today, is market value today is a dollar. This is our preferred or our best option to find RP. Well, what if we don't know the market value of preferred? Then we'll use the dividend paid at time one and time one, and since it's both the same, it doesn't matter. It's just at the same point. Okay, that's what that indicates. Divided by the book value of the preferred for the same time period. That's not as good, but it's okay. If you don't have this information, if we don't know the market value of the preferred, we can think of RP as being the dividends being paid divided by the 
the book value of the preferred. And I don't care if this is a per share dividend and a per share book value or an aggregate dividend and an aggregate book, va book value, it's the same percentage outcome. Does that make sense? Those are the two options. Anything else, we simply put our hand into the hat, pull out a number, and say that's good. It's a guess. Okay. Well, I think it's fairly easy for us to conceptualize how debt and preferred stock have a cost to us necessarily as a company, right? We must make the payment for every period that's contracted. We write it out. It's an expense. It comes off of the income statement, right? Is it necessary for us to make a payment to the holders of common stock? No. Never. Unless we said we were going to and we publicized that, then we kind of have to. We've contracted. But we're not required to do it, are we? So then what is the notion of cost to the company for having issued common stock? says I ever have to write out a check for it. Well, Sway buys a thousand shares. I'm certainly not going to pay him back. You know, he owns part of the company, right? He's going to get paid back. Well, maybe I'll buy it back. That's because you guys, the board of directors, decided we would, right? Or maybe, um, maybe you'll sell it. But does that affect me and the company? I, you know, I'm the CEO. If he sells it to somebody else in the open market, no effect at all. How is it that we can say that the company's issuance of common stock has a cost to the company. What do you think? Get creative. What do you think? You're Please, Lisa. Lisa. It should raise your hand. I guess you could look at it from a perspective of taxes. If you have more debt than equity, you get a write off in taxes. Yeah, I mean, th th that's not inaccurate. Mm -hmm what you said, but I'm not sure that it <coughs> tracks to what we're talking about. It's not inaccurate conceptually. What else? So Via Lobos Corporation, yes. you, um, you're the founder, innovator, CEO, chairman of the board. Okay? Um, you made it happen, Maddie. You took nothing, raised some equity capital from us investors. You've made us wealthy. You've become wealthy. if you hadn't issued any of that stock to us? Innovator, creator, founder, you made it happen. Would you not have become wealthy anyway? We might argue that he would if he'd have been able to get his hands on the money. Maybe he could have borrowed all the money. Faced some big RD. If that would have been a honking RD, right? Because back then, you, I mean, you're 18 years old. Couldn't even wipe your own nose, right? Okay. Had no credibility. You had no credit rating. Didn't even have an old Pinto to drive around town. Okay. So, but if you could have borrowed the money, you never would have given up any equity in the company, and all of our riches today, minus the interest expense on the debt, would be yours, right? Was there a cost to you of having issued that equity capital? I'm going to say yes, because all of that money that we have, because you made us wealthy, you don't have it, right? And if you had kept all the equity for yourself, maybe you'd have all that riches, all those riches. So that which we have and you don't in this case, or the enriching, the enrichment that we have, is was your opportunity cost of having given away or sold away some of your equity. But that's a great big theory. Did you know what it was going to be at any moment in time? Can you measure it? You might look back on it and say, well, I can measure its past, but I'm worried about its future. I don't care about book values, right? They're historical artifacts, just like your memory in this, of this deal. I care about here and now in the market. So we have to come up with a way to think about RE that is credible, that, that passes muster in the market. We're going to talk about this. We're going to use something called the CAP-M equation, and then we'll look at the other forms, and then we're going to take a break. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay, I, know, I know I'm going for a long time. I apologize if I'm boring you terribly. But it's your problem, not mine, so I'm going to keep going.
Cap M. Capital Asset Pricing Model uses something referred to as the security market line to illustrate. If on this axis we have some percentage rate of return, and on this axis we have something referred to as a beta factor, we know that the security market line for a company is almost always upward sloping. So we better talk about a beta factor. You clearly know what a percentage rate is, right? What's a beta factor when it comes to equity, common stock of a company? Risk. So who said that? Chris? So risk, or um, I'm going to just fine tune it and say it's a measure that tells us about risk because it tells us the fault. Excuse me the volatility of that company's share value compared to its industry peers, or compared to the average of its industry peers, okay? Which does tell us something about risk. When a company's beta value is one, it means its market volatility or its risk is equal to the average of the volatility or the risk for all companies in its industry grouping. It's equal to the average. It has the average level. It has a beta factor of one. If its beta factor is greater than one, it has greater volatility, greater risk, then it's industry peers. If its, if its factor is less than one, then it has less. Simple as that. We can find the beta factors by taking the variance and the distribution for the market volatility by tracking the price of the mark, the market price of those shares over whatever period of time. But means there has to be market prices. And we're going to apply a little statistics to it, and it's going to give us a number. Okay, it's actually the distribution for the meat. So apparently, this is going to have to be a publicly traded company in order for us to know its beta factor really. Alright? Well, if it if its beta factor is 1, we believe then that the return we're getting is similar to the return that we get for all firms in the industry. It's the average. If its risk factor and volatility is average, its return is average, right? And we call that number RM, the average return. I don't know why it's M. Well, that's what we call it, okay? Average return for the industry. Maybe it's the market. If there is no volatility, if it is cut and dry, perfectly safe, they print their own money, or backed by the full faith and credit of something that does, that number is RF. Risk-free is how many people remember that. RF. Risk-free rate of return. Well, the only instruments that I know of that are risk-free, if you will, are <coughs> instruments backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. And even that's subject to a little bit of creativity to think about, right? But it's as good as we got. And I can think of a short-term two-year CD, since it's backed by FDIC, which is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. I can think that that might be a risk-free rate. I can think a two-year treasury bond bill, no, excuse me, um, is a uh, risk-free rate. The reason I wouldn't necessarily say a 20-year CD or a 20-year bond or bill from the Treasury is because that's so much time, I, I'm just uncomfortable with it. But if I, I might say a 2-year, I might say even a 10-year. Those are pretty risk-free, right? And so when we think of a risk-free rate, we're thinking of something along those lines. So if you see a problem set that says the U.S. Treasury, the 2-year U.S. Treasury is at 2.4%, then what is RF? 2.4 percent. Okay. All right. So the cap M equation, though, is so this is the cap M form for R E. So R E using cap M equals R F plus R M minus R F times beta. I'm going to talk about the various components of that, what they kind of infer here for a moment. Okay. 
This is the very best version of RE that we have. It's the most accurate, it's the preferred if you have the data. And if you don't, well then we maybe can't use that one while you have to use something subordinate to it. Let's look at this equation. If RM is the industry average rate of return for that type of investment, that type of common stock, that type of company, and RF is risk free, then the difference between them is the yield spread or the risk premium for having invested in that type of company. RF would be the premium for having invested, period, with no risk at all. Here, if we're investing in that type of company, in that type of market, then RM minus RF is the risk premium for investing in that type of company, that type of market. When we interact RM minus RF with B, that's the risk premium for investing in that specific company, right? Because B is specific to the company. It's the market volatility of that company's common shares. So risk premium for investing in that type of firm in the market, risk premium for investing in that particular company in the market, risk premium for investing overall. Opportunity cost of or reward, benefit of, common stock. If I told you that a company had no established beta, but that its volatility level was 88% of its industry peers, what would be its beta factor? It has no established beta, but its volatility level is 88% or 12% less than its industry peers. I think it would be 88%, would it not? Yeah. Yeah. Because I was using a percent. Because one is 100%. Okay. I tell you that because you're going to see a problem set at a point that uses that same kind of language. On the problem sets, I try to give you all the information you need, but I don't necessarily just put it out there in a black and white thing or with a neon sign pointing to it and say, this is the number. I'm trying to see if you can interpret these things from our discussions. All right? And you'd be working in, in groups and such. They'll help you too. Well, sometimes I said we don't have a beta factor because we don't have a market uh, instrument. So we have to look at something else. You'll remember, and don't write this down yet. You'll remember that in a finance <coughs> class at some point, you were told the price of a common stock at time zero was equal to the dividend that it's expected to pay next time divided by its discount rate minus its growth rate called the dividend yield or the dividend growth equation. Okay? You might remember that. We'll talk later tonight about why this equation holds. All right. Well, a couple of guys out there by the name of Medigliani and Miller, I think I mentioned them to you last week, said, you know what? If this is the price of the common stock, and this is the dividend that's being issued by the common stock, and this is the growth rate of the dividend, then this R is RE. And if we know the price of the common stock to dividend and, and we have a growth, we can reverse engineer this thing such that RE is equal to the dividend divided by the price uh, plus the rate of growth. Price here you're saying is the market price. Market price of the common stock. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if we don't know RE because we don't have a beta, but we do have an established price for the stock somehow, if we have an expectation of what the dividend is going to be like the next time it pays it, so it must be a track record or a statement or something. If we have an expectation of what that growth rate of that dividend should be because of some other knowledge, we can reverse engineer and calculate RE. So now I'm going to put it in the right place. RE is equal to D1 divided by P0 plus G. It's just a re-engineering of the dividend yield to dividend growth equation to normalize or solve for its R. Because Medigliani and Miller convinced us that that R 
If everything else about the equation is about the common stock, the R must also be about the common stock. But Otherwise, that, it doesn't make sense. But that is only assuming they actually pay a dividend. If they do That's not, assuming you pay a dividend. Then we don't have yeah. that. Part of the reason why it's not best. Okay. It's, it's okay if we've got it. It's better than nothing. It's not best. And sadly, as we go down the line, you tell me. There's no other credible way of thinking about RE unless you hold true to the thought that you're an investor in common stock equities in the market and you have a required rate of return of X, 9%, 4%, 32%, whatever yours is based upon your experience and your opportunity cost of that kind of investing, you might be able to use that as RE in a pinch. But I'm telling you now, it's pain to pinch. I got you with some vice grips. Okay? Yes, Walter? It seems like some companies are driving in the direction that they're substituting share repurchases in place of dividends. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about share repurchases, buybacks, yeah. at a point, not tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to put them in perspective, and you're going to understand all about why that would be. And that's just a form of financial engineering that we're going to explore in another video. <coughs> Is it ever appropriate to put that number as a replacement? Well, if it's a dollar value, um, 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 well, I don't know that it would be. I have to think about that. You'll get back to me. Because if it's a dollar value, because what I'm concerned about is if they're doing a share repurchase of a bunch of shares, they may have to be, they may have to buy them back at greater than their market price. In which case, this is more than 100 percent plus a rate of growth, which means that RE is honking. Okay. It's over 100%. Mm. And I'm not sure if I have digested that well enough to think that I believe it. Yeah. Okay, we'll think about that. Imagine. I'm just trying to figure out why would the second one would be you know, okay versus the other one is best because the other one has a risk factor, the beta. And the second is growth, and they both seems to be estimated or guesstimated. Mm. Why would it be the risk? Not. The risk factor of beta is observed. We look at the market volatility of the company's share price over some historic period. We observed okay. it. Now, what, it, what is guessing is that we think that its risk volatility in the future is going to be the same as its risk volatility in the past. But that's probably not a bad bet to make, right? The path dependence. Then you may have some reason to modify a little bit. That's a good point. I just think that this is more of a guess than that. Because we observe this. This is purely future. Good question, though. Nobody's ever asked that. Good for you. Okay, so um, let's take a brief break. Uh, let's be back in here at um, no later than five minutes till. If you're in here before that, I'm a happy guy. Uh, but no later than five minutes till. And then we're going to come back to the wacky equation and put all these things in. Okay? And we're actually going to do some numeric examples for a few minutes. Yes? Sure.